Okay, so we have successfully ran our resource allocation model in Genius. So now let's go through interpreting the results. First, let's take a look at the unconstrained model. So what exactly is it that we have? Well, for each one of the geographic markets, we now have connected our inputs to our outputs with a mathematical response model. In our case, we fitted a logistic model for each one of the 14 markets. By incorporating other financial knowledge and assumptions, so like the percent margin, uh, cost per salesperson, and so on, we can then take these input-output sales estimates and actually map them onto profitability, or in our case, we we'll call it net margin, across a variety of different scenarios of allocating salespeople to different markets. And when we're ready to do so, we can actually start doing some what-if testing where we can impose different constraints on the model, sort of requiring minimum and maximum number of salespeople being allocated to try to maximize profits under a different set of hypothetical uh, business scenarios. So first, let's just take a look at the base scenario table that comes out of the output. This is just doing the math for us based on the inputs that we gave to it. So here's all our current number of reps, our current sales. These are all inputs into the model. Cost per sales rep, again, it's just an input into the model and our margin percent. We do have three new columns here, cost of effort, gross margin, and net margin, where cost of effort is simply just the number of sales reps uh, times the cost per sales rep. The gross margin is our current sales estimate times our percent margin here. And our net margin is simply taking the gross margin and subtracting out the cost of the salespeople. Then of course, down here is our overall goal, where we want to try to maximize our total net margin by changing up the current number of sales reps in the different markets here, our inputs. So let's take a look at the unconstrained optimization solution. So unconstrained means it just ignores if we happen to impose any global constraints for our inputs or any regional constraints or segment uh, constraints for our inputs. It just simply ignores them and says, what's the absolute best solution I can give you? And what we see here uh, based on Ingenius's output is we can actually move from making about $28.7 million to $39.6 million. So we could actually improve our net margin by about 38% if we optimize our allocation and usage of salespeople. And you can see that uh, within each individual market, we can improve our net margin. In some cases, we can only move it a little bit uh, improve it just a little bit from where we're at. So in the case of like San Francisco here, it just bumps a little bit up. But in Cleveland and Los Angeles and Dallas, a optimal solution actually bumps up the net margin in that particular market quite a bit. So again, this is our best case, assuming we have absolutely no constraints. We can see that here when we look at our effort level for our optimization. Notice here, our base effort number of salespeople, we now have an optimized effort where this is the absolute peak number of salespeople we should apply to each one of the markets. In the case of Los Angeles, we should more than double the number of salespeople. And in every single one of the markets, the recommendation per the model is to increase the size of our sales force. Again, this assumes no constraints, right? We're gonna to need to hire 98.34 salespeople to reach the optimal net margin. So one other thing that instantly becomes revealed here when we look at our optimal solutions is that it assumes that that input thing that we're working with, um, it doesn't presume that it's an integer. It presumes that we can allow it to be fractional in nature. And it's probably not the case that we can hire 7.73 uh, salespeople in Clint anyway. So if we ever wanted to try to apply this model literally, we would probably want to uh, rerun it where we forcibly change the solution to a whole integer value and see what the prediction is. Another part of the output that we asked for was it for it to conduct a sensitivity analysis. And what the sensitivity analysis does here is if we look along the x-axis, it's going to vary the total amount of the inputs that we have to work with. And then at each one of those levels, of total number of salespeople, it'll find the combination and mixture of salespeople allocated across the different markets that optimizes net margin. So this purple line here represents at different levels of total number of salespeople, the absolute highest net margin that the model was capable of finding. 
and it'll provide a recommendation for us where that net margin peaks. And of course, remember it'll peak because uh, it costs us more money to add more salespeople. And we also observe per our model that there are saturation effects that eventually hit in each one of the markets, right? We add more salespeople, which costs us money, but we don't actually drive uh, more sales. So, and we also see our current here, and there's a few important takeaways that we can see even just looking at the uh, unconstrained model solution. So first we know that if we get all that we need to be our absolute best and we move up to having 98 salespeople, uh, we predict that we could actually make quite a bit more profit. On the other hand, if you recall at the beginning of the case, we already found that we aren't in a position where we can add more salespeople. Corporate, for whatever reason it is, we are trapped in a world where 52 salespeople is really all we can work with. But even here, we can see that our current mixture of 52 salespeople is not optimal. We could reallocate those 52 individuals into different markets, and that itself would actually improve our profitability even under that constraint. So you can see that our current allocation is under this purple line here. So there's a gap between what we're doing and what we could be even with the limited resources we have. So we could in fact work smarter and still not work any harder in other words. Let's do some hypothetical wargaming here where we test different scenarios and in some cases we're going to, have to impose new constraints onto the model to account for those real world scenarios. Keep in mind that in the video that I'm presenting here, I'm not answering the same question prompts that were in the case. Rather, I'm illustrating for you a new set of different hypothetical scenarios so that you yourself could go back and actually figure out how to tackle those questions that are presented in the case. So let's consider our very first scenario here. So in scenario one, let's imagine that it's sort of a times are tight for us, the business, but we really don't wanna turn off the lights uh, of our sales effort. So the specific constraints that we're gonna to wanna to impose here is that all of our markets, all 14 geographic markets, still must maintain at least one salesperson. So even though times are tough, we don't absolutely wanna shutter any of the areas. On the other hand, we also don't, aren't willing to add uh, any more than three individuals to any one market. And finally, we're gonna to have to cut our sales force down from 52 people all the way down to 24. How do we impose these constraints and how do we maximize our profits under these constraints? Back in your ingenious menu, in your segment specific constraints, constraints table, we just add ones across the board for the minimum, meaning you have to have at least one salesperson. And for the maximum, we set it to three. You can't have more than three salespeople. And then in our constraints menu, when we go to run our resource allocation, we're gonna to wanna to set our global maximum effort constraint to 24. So this says, uh, no matter what we do, we couldn't put, for example, three salespeople in every one of the 14 markets because that would equal more than 24. So after running that model, here's our results demonstrating our optimal allocation of our resource, meaning our salespeople, under this new constraint. So. So here's our base effort where we originally had 52 employees and under our optimized effort here, notice the small rounding error. Again, remember there's this strange sort of integer imprecise solution here when Ingenious tries to optimize. And our optimized effort bounces around basically between the two minimal and maximal constraints. Either it identifies a market as only requiring one individual or we try to max it out to three. So in the case of like Los Angeles and San Francisco, the best solution possible is actually to cut the sales force as, extremely, as extreme as possible. Whereas for places like Seattle, Nashville, St. Louis and the Twin Cities, we want to maintain as high of a sales force as possible to maximize our net margin. And we see that here in our next optimization table where yes, when we go from 52 salespeople all the way down to 24, we are absolutely going to be losing some money. In fact, the best we can do is, is lose 23% of our profitability. Um, but this is the, but this is the absolute best allocation to lose the least amount of money under these constraints. Now it's typical when you run these types of heavily constrained resource allocation models, um, it can be a bit shocking about how those constraints can really undermine your ability to um, achieve your objectives. So when you're confronted with this realization, sometimes it's, uh, it's, it's nice to know 
where might we actually want to entertain relaxing some of these constraints a little bit further so that we really can maximize to the best of our ability our, our profits. So uh, one of the outputs in Ingenious that's rather nice here is the opportunity cost table. Um, I've These are the same results you would see in Ingenious. I have restructured them uh, so they're, little, they're presented vertically, but the numbers are the same. And what we see here in this minimum column the minimum column assumes what happens if you take your minimum constraint and reduce that number by one. So in our case, we set that number at one salesperson for every one of the markets. So this is asking what would happen to our total net margin if we actually allowed zero salespeople in any one of the markets, right? We drop that number down one. And we can see here in many cases by eliminating a salesperson, we can actually improve our overall uh, profitability. Similarly, on the maximum side, it asks the question of what happens if you bump up your maximum constraint by one unit? Well, how would that affect your net margin? And in our case, again, we had three salespeople per market set as our, global, uh, as our segment maximum. So this is asking what happens if you bump that number up to four? And we see here in Seattle, Cleveland, Nashville, St. Louis, and Twin Cities, it turns out that if you actually bump up that uh, and allow for an, an additional salesperson, we could actually improve our net margin. So this opportunity cost table is useful because it does show where maybe once you're confronted with the actual simulated numbers, maybe management is willing to relax one of those strict hard constraints uh, that it imposed before it saw the results and, and realizes it actually could make quite a bit more money by doing so. And here again, we have a, a sensitivity analysis figure. And the only thing that's different about this particular uh, figure to the previous one is now we have our constrained version of our model here. And notice that our constrained version of our model is both below the absolute optimal net margin it can achieve even at this constraint level. And it's of course quite a bit lower than the optimal profitability from the unconstrained model where we could have any number of salespeople. So this red bar that we're looking at now, that's due to the fact that we have a total global maximum of 24 salespeople. And the gap here between the best we could do at 24 salespeople and what we can actually do per our constraints, that's all due to our segment specific constraints of requiring a minimum of one salesperson and a maximum of three salespeople. Now let's consider another scenario. Now in this scenario, we're not going to have to uh, mess with the constraints so much, but rather we're going to consider how we might manipulate some of the input values that we had elsewhere in the model to derive new predictions and forecasts. So in this scenario, let's imagine that there was a giant exogenous negative shock to the entire economy, right? But we, the individual company, are financially okay for the moment. Also part of these constraints are we are determined to sort of keep the lights on. So again, we want to see if we can retain at least one salesperson in every one of our markets. Finally, we do want to maintain full employment. So in this scenario, we're not going to entertain hiring new people in the middle of an economic crisis, but we will say that we aren't going to fire anybody or reduce our total number of salespeople. So we are going to stick to a global maximum of 52 salespeople, although they might have to move to alternative markets, if that makes sense. Now, the numbers that you see below here are something that I computed in Excel, but you would bring over as appropriate into Ingenious. So notice here, these are, of course, just hypothetical numbers, but these are the imagined um, financial impact, the decline, if you will, from the original scenario uh, in each of the 14 markets. And from there, we simply derive these values for the new impact estimates. So these would be the things that we copy and paste into the appropriate ingenious table. And again, these numbers are simply the original impact estimates that we had shown previously, multiplied by one minus the, rel the relevant uh, impact decline percentage. So we added those values into ingenious. Uh, don't forget to update the base scenario as well, based uh, on the table that we just updated. And of course, we need to set our segment specific and global constraints as well. So minimum of one, for each one of the markets, and we also need to set our global maximum to 52. And in this scenario here, again, each one of those response models, those logistic response models, of course, are going to be recalibrated. A different um, mathematical form will manifest, and those different mathematical forms for each one of those 14 models, which you could review in the output, 
of course, no surprise, results in a different allocation of uh, optimizations. And here we, uh, we reduce down to the bare minimum our uh, sales force in Los Angeles, San Francisco, and Cincinnati, also Philadelphia, many places that were hit quite hard by our theoretical crisis. Uh, on other hand, in places like Boston and Chicago, we actually recommend that we increase our sales force. And here, using our original sales force allocation, again, this is our original sales force allocation, but the crisis has happened. So notice that our, our, base, our base profitability here, of course, is much lower than it was in the original scenario before we imagined an economic crisis. In the assumption of an economic crisis, it shows that our status quo of our allocation of sales force is wrong. We should, in fact, reallocate as the previous slide shown, and we can still improve our net margin by about 17%. And you can see that result here where under the constraint of staying at exactly 52 total employees, our constrained model improves net margin quite a bit compared to the original allocation. And there's just a small difference between our model and the absolute optimal. Did you catch what that difference might be due to? Again, the difference is always because of the segment specific constraints that would account for the different, the gap between our, our, our allocation and the optimal allocation. So again, remember, we were determined to keep the lights on in every one of the markets and not and always have at least one salesperson. So we do sort of not quite optimize our profitability by keeping at least one salespeople, uh, salesperson in some of those markets. In the next part of this video, I would like to circle back to one of the underlying assumptions that I made in my uh, resource allocation model and see how valid it really seemed to be. So let's go back to the very original scenario for CTEC. So if you are not following along, you would simply reload the CTEC case into Ingenious and go back to the original input values and all of the things that were set per normal. Remember, in my setup, I specified that all 14 of the markets should use a logistic model rather than having it set to ad bug, exponential, or automatic. Now, when I made this choice, that was a pretty powerful assumption that me, the analyst, had made. And now thinking about all these bold uh, business management recommendations that I made, I mean, I'm, I'm literally suggesting to CTEC that certain people might literally have to move across the country to keep their job to make this company more money. I really do want to think about whether or not um, my assumption of the model I chose might be driving this more than the underlying data itself. So I performed a little test here. What I did was I reran the base analysis four different times. And in the first three times, I changed the response modeling type to ad bug, then to logistic, then to an exponential. And then finally, I, in the fourth model run, I set it to automatic, meaning that each one of the segments would uh, the ingenious itself would pick whether an ad bug logistic or exponential fit a given geographic market best. So I ran these models four times and I stored the results into a table so that I could compare the different allocation the resource allocations. Now my hope is that when I see the results, regardless of which one of the response models I pick, the resource allocation optimization is about the same that would indicate to me that it's not so much my assumption that's affecting the results, but rather the underlying data itself is what's really driving the insights. And that would be a nice thing if that's true. And after I ran this, I had an uh-oh. So here, I, I built this table myself. We have the 14 different geographic markets. Here was our base effort, the number of uh, sales employees that we were distributing in the base scenario. And here's for the four different models I ran, ad bug, logistic, exponential, and automatic. And of course, this is a lot of uh, the data, but this column hits home the main story. I'm simply looking at the range estimate of the number of salespeople that the models are telling me to allocate um, across each one of the four models I chose. And some of these numbers are frighteningly large. For example, in Los Angeles, uh, in some cases, the logistic and automatic model, which of course must be choosing, I think, logistic, is saying that I should allocate no salespeople to Los Angeles. On the other hand, the ad bug model says I should use 5.1 salespeople, which we might interpret as about five salespeople 
um, to Los Angeles. So there's a wide swing in how it's suggesting I allocate these sales resources. And we see that again here in High Point. And even in places like Philadelphia, we see differences of approximately two different of two salespeople. So what I've learned by looking at these results here is that the model, the model response type that I chose had a big impact on how it allocated. Um, this is a little worrying. And although I don't do this in this uh, video case here, this is the kind of thing where as the analyst, you might want to sit back and say, well, now what do we do? I, I don't want to be in a world where my assumptions as the analyst are imposing the truth onto the situation. We're trying to, when we make assumptions, make assumptions that best fit reality and hopefully don't contaminate our insights too much. So uh, there's one option. And our first option here is it, maybe it really isn't so bad after all. Um, you know, it might be true that the type of optimization problem we're in right now is that there's actually a whole bunch of different ways we could mix up and reallocate our sales force and keep hitting the exact same global maxima for profitability or very close to the near maxima. In other words, it's sort of a ripply wave problem where there's many different peak points of profitability across different levels of allocation of our inputs. Other pieces of software, not ingenious, uh, would be able to sort of test for this sort of multiple global maxima or near global maximal scenario, but we don't have that available to us. Um, what we could do if we wanted to was I could do something like take the recommended input levels for say per the ad bug only model, take those input numbers, plug those input values into the recommendations um, of the say exponential models, the inputs, and see if my net margin stays much the same. Um, if that's the case, that would indicate to me that uh, it's quite likely here that actually my modeling assumptions aren't uh, quite uh, quite poisoning the well of recommendations quite as much as I'm, I'm, I'm thinking at this moment. Now, there's another option here as well. Now, we could, of course, get more data. First of all, if the data, the, the relationship between the input, number of salespeople, and the output, the sales of, uh, effect, was real-world data, so I actually had real data that we are historically tracking in different markets, um, I'd be much more willing to rely on that high quality data as a gold standard to calibrate my models. And then I would use the automatic modeling option because I would have real data to calibrate on rather than this hypothetical wisdom of the management data that we are basing all of these assumptions on. Uh, but in a world where we simply don't have access to secondary data and we still have to rely on managerial wisdom, we could in fact still bolster that wisdom data set a bit more. Uh, keep in mind, right now for each one of these markets, we only have five data points to work with. The amount of sales when we have no salespeople, a low amount of salespeople, the base level, the high level, and the saturation point. So we're calibrating these curved response models using only five points. Um, we could go back to management and ask them to specify rigorously, of course, their most wise and well thought out sales numbers at a few additional val uh, number of salespeople. And by having additional sales uh, data points to calibrate our response models on, I would be uh, a little more inclined to trust the automatic response modeling option or check more carefully across the three different options, ad bug, logistic, or exponential, and pick uh, the one kind that on uh, overall has the uh, least error between the wisdom of the management's uh, data and the response model curves themselves. So in other words, in wrapping up our discussion of this case, I, I do want to highlight a few other important points. Remember that this was not just an example of how to allocate salespeople across geographic regions. You need to keep in mind the simile or the metaphor that we're using of this case and extend it to other ways that we might apply it as marketers. So in this reallocation model, our effort, our input, in other words, was salespeople. But of course, 
effort can be anything that could be an input that a marketer might utilize, right? Advertising impressions, number of cold calls, the number of direct mailing units that are sold. Um, these are, they can be anything that a marketer can systematically choose to vary. And they're almost always the kind of things that cost money for us to allocate. In this case, our impact was sales dollars, but it could be other things. It could be the number of people who subscribe to an email newsletter, the number of new customers that were referred to us uh, by current customers, uh, the number of current customers who re-upped an annual contract. In other words, it could be any relevant marketing objective, the kind of thing that we wish we could control, but we can't control directly. When we use the word segment here, we're using regional geographic market in the case, but we could even extend what we mean by segment a little more broadly. If, I mean, segment, of course, could mean the 20 different needs-based market segments that our company utilizes to understand our customer base. And even more abstractly, we can think of the word segment here to mean any criteria that we could use to allocate our efforts specifically. So in regional markets, we can allocate different salespeople, but you could even think of things like day of the month to allocate our distribution of direct mailers. There's another thing that was going on in this case that we talked about quite a bit, and we've talked about quite a bit this semester as well, but, is often, but, but students often lose sight of it. And that's when we are selecting the right response model, so in this case, logistic, ad bug, exponential, or it could be a variety of any others, uh, power series, linear, so on. Remember, it's not about picking the response model that gives you the best managerial answer. It's about picking the one that best approximates reality. So when you're selecting a response model, this would be an example of a poor justification. Uh, the ad bug model says we'll make the most profit, so we'll use that one. That is wrong-headed thinking. An example of right-headed thinking would be after testing multiple different response models, the exponential model was the one that most consistently fit our input-output data well. That's an example of using a rationale where the response model or the math form is most closely fitting the data and the data is the representation of reality. That's valid. Well, everybody, that wraps up our introduction to the CTEC case and our discussion about marketing resource allocation using the reallocator model. And remember, CTEC would want you to keep on grinding.